to go through is the sound, which should be fairly familiar to any of you that have aligned an FM radio before. One of the differences, though, is that TVs use a 4.5 megahertz carrier as compared to a typical FM radio, which uses 10.7. Now I, I need to inject a signal into the set that's 4.5 megahertz and ideally you would have a crystal reference. And unfortunately the only one I've got is 10.7 which is a shame because this Leader 17A actually has a crystal socket right on the front for just this purpose. To use it, insert the crystal, put this on low and there you go, 10.7 megahertz. But unfortunately, I'm just going to have to do the best I can using the built in oscillator and just <laughs> try to get it on 4.5 as accurately as I can. This generator is pretty stable, so I'm not that concerned about it. I've also had all this equipment on for a few hours, so it's really pretty well temperature stabilized. Uh, I'd say that's pretty darn close to 4.5 megahertz. <laughs> okay, I have my RF going in via a 0 0.01 microfarad cap to this point my VTVM hooked up to this point. It's all clearly identified on the alignment instructions. This is where the signal's injected and this point Y here, that's where the VTVM is hooked up. I'm supposed to peak A5 and A6 while keeping the signal at a low enough level that it reads about one volt on the VTVM and here's what I'm going to be tweaking A5 and A6 for a max and then A7 we'll get to in a moment alright first up A5 which is the top slug in this can we want a maximum Past it. Right about there. And now a six. Need a different tool for that. So this was an internal slug, so I used the slotted plastic tool. And this other slug is one that is extended out with a brass shaft, and for that I need a tool that uh, has a a slotted end with a tube around it to fit over the top of that shaft. There we go. Well, some of them off by too much. So, people about there. The last step is to zero the ratio detector. For that we need to move the VTVM connection over to this point, which is Z. And then we are supposed to use the zero scale on the VTVM. Most of VTVMs have a mode where, or they should, I should say they have a zero mark. So what you can do is zero out the probes and you adjust the zero adjust so that it's actually reading in the middle when you have no input. Because this point we're going to be testing can swing positive and negative as it's detecting the FM signal. Well with no modulation, just a carrier, we want to get a response that's zero. 
back up. And as you can see, we're off. That should be zero right now. The slug for that is actually on the bottom of the set. So that A5 I was adjusting a moment ago, that big, that big aluminum can, that actually has a slug going through the bottom of the set as well. Ooh, pretty sensitive there. And simply, so as you go back and forth, you should be able to swing that needle to either side, and you simply want it to be dead center. Now that the electronics are done, I want to move on to the cabinet. First, I want to deal with the missing foot. Originally, there were four hard rubber feet like this. Um, some of them are mushed down, like on this side. And this back one is missing completely. All I've got on hand are some hard plastic ones, but I think they'll do the job all right. There are reproductions available from outfits like Antique Electronics Supply. Maybe next time I place an order I'll pick some up, but for the time being, I want to go with these. I've got to do something, it's just so wobbly right now without that foot being on there. So, first thing i got to do, grab a screwdriver and remove these. Okay, i got those four new feet on there. Nice and level and stable. Now for the rest of the cabinet. It's not in the greatest condition, unfortunately. A lot of scratches. It will probably require some wet sanding to get these out. But first up, I'm just going to try some Novus. I'll give me a better idea just how bad those scratches are. And maybe it won't look too bad. We'll see. Also, I want to spruce up the front a little bit. Um, I want to get this off before we do any work too, but if you ever have to take one of these off, be very, very, very careful, because they're so easy to crack. Got a piece of padding here so I can tip this up face down. That channel thingy is held on by a wire spring and there's little plastic clips here. These are what break off so easily. To get them off, you need to kind of push down and squeeze together at the same time. Very slowly, very carefully. Then you can pop it out. And as for this, uh, looks like we've got one, two, three, four, uh, six screws holding it in. I'll take this out as well so I can clean it. And let's see, how does that lettering look? Not too bad. If it was worse, I would take some white artist acrylic paint and rub it in to fill the lettering in, but I think this is pretty good as it is. Just dirty. Pretty nasty scratch in here too. We'll see what Novus can do about that. All right, I got it off without breaking it. I actually have one set that's missing this. I think I may try to fabricate one from scratch. I think if I take a piece of clear plastic, cut it to a square, round off the corners to get this overall shape, drill a big hole in the middle, and then apply some decals for the channel numbers and then back paint it with some brass spray paint. I think it'll be a reasonable effect similar. Because these never show up. Uh, I know there's a few other guys out there that need them too. And I've never seen these for sale on eBay or anything. Because the only place you're going to get one is from a set. And <laughs> unless uh, maybe the, a big light cabinet gets completely smashed, you're just not going to find any of these spare floating around. Here's face plate. The foam gasket is pretty miserable. I think I'll be replacing this with some closed cell foam insulation. In some areas it's really got a lot of 
crusty. It just disintegrates when you put pressure on it. As it was cabinet. Some Novus number two. And some nice clean new rags. So I'm just gonna squirt some on here. Just want to get some idea how this might clean up. Probably partly dirt and partly some of the actual Bakelite material coming off because this is an abrasive so we'll actually remove some of the material but that's just part of the polishing process if you were to use wax wax sort of fills in the voids but when you use polish like this it actually wears down the surface a little bit to make it uh, smoother Let that dry a bit. And I'll buff it out. Well, certainly better, but of course those scratches are still really visible. Otherwise, not bad. Pretty shiny there. Well, I do have some sandpaper, so uh, what the heck? I'll give it a I'll give it a quick try. The sides aren't bad. The front's not bad. It's really just this top. This was sitting in a garage. I got it at an estate sale, and I, they, I'm sure they've been piling crap on top of it for years. Here's the materials I'm going to be using. A little bowl with a couple drops of dish detergent and some warm water. And I've got 600 grit, 1000 grit, 1500 grit, and this block is 2000 grit. Start out with the 600 on some of the worst areas. See how that goes. I've heard plenty of warnings about doing this, that if you over sand, you can go through the shiny coat to kind of a pulpy interior. So uh, <laughs> keep that in mind if uh, before you decide to go ahead and start sanding. And don't take off too much material, because really deep scratches, I think you'd be better off just leaving them alone or try to fill it in like uh, say with a two-part epoxy and try to put some uh, maybe come some kind of black dye or I've heard you can even uh, take an old chunk of Bakelite or something else it's the same color and grind it up like with a uh, grinding wheel or whatever just to get some uh, dust that's the right color then mix that into the glue smear that into your, uh, your scratch and then sand it down or you if you can't just get some kind of putty wood filler whatever just something that's close enough to the same color that can kind of fill those scratches in it's 
some wax might actually work. Like if you can find a black candle, you fill it in with some black wax. I finished up with all the grits of sandpaper. I wiped the cabinet down and now I'm going over it with notice number two. I think you'd see what a difference just a little bit of the Novus does after the wet sanding. It's looking much, much better. I've moved on to one of the sides now, which are in much better shape than the top was, so no need to sand. I'm just going right to the Novus number two. And uh, <laughs> lots of fun grooves to clean out. I'm just squirting a little bit of the Novus in there and running a rag down it. And then I will buff out the residue and uh, whatever is remaining in the corners and crevices, I'll clean out with a toothpick. You never want to use metal on big light. Always use something like a toothpick or a plastic, you know, wood or plastic. Now, if you look close in this area here, some little paint spatters. I've read numerous tricks to get these out, like using vinegar, but these come out easily enough just uh, with a fingernail. Especially after going over it a bit with the Novus, it seems to really loosen it up. Or even just rubbing enough with some of the uh, Novus number two. Seems to get them out pretty well. So it shouldn't be too much longer. I don't have this whole cabinet all nice and shiny. I've moved on to cleaning up the knobs in the channel plate. These inner knobs are plastic think, or it could be Bakelite, and they've got this inner waffle pattern that's kind of a pain to clean out, and fairly grungy overall. So what I'm going to do to clean these up is soak them for an hour or two in some multi-purpose degreaser cleaner, like 409. I like to cut it 50-50 with water, and uh, all this dirt should just float right off, and then I'll use an old toothbrush to clean up any residue. The outer knobs are actually metal clad with kind of a silvery base metal that's brass plated and they have these felt uh, backing washers. I'll take these off before I do any cleaning on because I want them to I want to reuse them. I don't want them to get any cleaning products on them. What these are for is so that the cabinet doesn't get scratched up when you rotate the knobs. So this goes between the cabinet and the back of the knob. You can see how filthy these get. Well, with a little bit of effort, you can get them nice and shiny. This one I just started working on, and here are a couple I've already done. If you're lucky, they'll turn out like this. I've also encountered knobs that have been polished a few too many times and they're silvery because the brass is worn down to the base metal. In which case, you can either learn to like it like that or you can get them re-brass plated. I actually picked up one of those uh, Caswell brush plating kits for doing home electro plating and they work okay. In the future, uh, if I need to, I'll show that. Although I think I do have an old video where I showed some. 
Uh, at any rate, these seem to be in pretty good shape, so I don't think I'll have to mess around with that. For the first pass, I uh, used Brasso to get the worst of the crud off, and then I switched to Simichrome to get this really nice high luster. And as for this, I'll just use some Novus Number 2 carefully, just in the top surface. I don't want to mess up this back painting on it. I like to use the Brasso until I get them looking about like this, and then I'll switch to the Simichrome. Simichrome is a lot more expensive than the Brasso, so that's why I like to use it first. Plus it's a bit more abrasive and we'll get this really tarnished surface off faster than the Simichrome. So I've just squirt a bit of this onto the rag. And then start rubbing. Espresso is a combination of abrasive powder and ammonia. I believe the ammonia helps to break down the copper oxide or whatever else the tarnish is composed of. And pretty quickly start to see some of that shine come through. You can see the crud that's left behind the rag. It actually starts to turn kind of greenish from the copper content. These will tarnish again over time, although the Simichrome claims to leave some kind of protective film on it to help slow that process down. I've also heard uh, some uh, an old trick is to put a little bit of olive oil over the brass. That might be fine for something that's not handled much, but for knobs, since you're going to be constantly touching them, I don't think the olive oil is too practical. Fingerprints do seem to accelerate the corrosion process. So uh, you could either keep polishing them periodically or what I've done in a couple sets is to clear coat them with lacquer. Mohawk makes a lacquer especially blended for brass. It seems to work pretty well. In this case though I think I'm just gonna leave them alone. I'm not crazy about putting lacquer over them because it wasn't there originally and I'd like to preserve you know, the originality as much as possible. And I'm kind of curious to see how uh, well they hold up over time. For all I know, these were never polished and it took, what, 60 <laughs> plus years to get looking like this. So hey, maybe uh, they'll start looking pretty good for a few years at least. Oh, and like I said, uh, I certainly have some knobs that appear to have been over polished, so keep that in mind too. You don't want to be too crazy aggressive with this. But uh, yeah, it doesn't take too much work. Now I need to get the top surface as well. I just kind of go around like so. Alright, I think it's time to switch to the Simichrome. I wiped off all the residue from the Brasso. Now let's move on to the Simichrome. I bought a large can because I go through a lot of this. Costs a bit though. I think this was something like 25 or 30 bucks. But I've used it on a lot of projects. You only need a small amount to clean or polish quite a bit of metal. You can also get much smaller tubes. I think it comes in like a one and three quarter ounce little tube. After it sits around for a long time, it kind of separates. Then like a clear uh, oil on top and then the pinkish uh, compound below. I think that 
oil-like substance is the protective film they talk about, and the pink stuff is the abrasive. So I'll just mix it up a bit. Yeah, there's a little bit that's on the end of the screwdriver here. It's probably going to be about all I'm going to need. Uh, i got a clean scrap of cloth here. Just an old sock I cut up. Polish a screwdriver up nice. And here we go. So you get that same black material coming off like with the brass on. It's actually wearing off a thin layer of the brass. So you want to go over this until it looks pretty good and take a clean section and buff it out. And it should look like that. After the knobs soaked for a couple hours, I took them out, dried them off with a paper towel and then used a hair dryer to get them completely dry and the nooks and crannies on the back side. There are metal shims in here that provide tension against the shaft and you want to get those dried out so they don't rust. And finally I'm going to polish them up with a little bit of uh, notice number two. Being careful not to get any into those waffle areas that I just cleaned out. I just want to get the sides here. Don't need much. These are pretty clean as they are. So just make them a little bit shinier. You don't want to wipe it all off. You want to leave some on, and let it dry, and then buff it out. Did this one a few minutes ago, so it's dry by now. There are a few hacks and scratches and so on here and there, but not much I can do about that. Otherwise, I think it looks pretty good. And against this brass, I think it looks really, really nice. Here's another little task I need to take care of. That is replacing this trashed power cord. It's all dried out, cracked, there's no way I can use this. As was typical of many sets back then, this is a two-pronged power cord that's riveted right onto the high voltage cage cover. I could drill these rivets out and either use a cheater cord and just stick it through there and have it unsecured or maybe screw it on but I've heard about a trick I've never tried it but supposedly if you can find a new one of these you can heat it up in some hot water and it will soften the rubber up enough that you can slide it over the existing brass rivets 
In other words, cut the old one out, but be careful to leave the brass rivets intact. Take the new one, get this pliable by heating it, and then mush it over these rivets. When it cools, it will harden in place. Now, as for where do you get a replacement heater core? Sorry, I don't have any secrets to that. I just got lucky. Or maybe I should say I was very diligent <laughs> with uh, searching around on eBay. A while back, there was a guy who had a few hundred of these Belden new old stock cheater cords. He was selling them, I think, for $3.95 each or something like that. And I was one of the last orders that got through before I ran out, so I got about five of these. And I got this awesome 20 piece assortment that's got uh, some brown ones, a couple white, some are polarized, some non polarized. So I'm going to hunt through all these and find the one that cl most closely matches the original. I've just about got the old cord out. I've just been nipping and chipping and picking away at it with small tools like this. It's so hard and brittle, it comes off pretty easy. It breaks apart pretty easy. Try, I've been trying very carefully not to gouge or scratch or damage the metal. Luckily, it's been pretty easy. This stuff just falls apart. Now the trick is to get this. I, I chose one of the Belden cords. They're in really nice shape, still very pliable, and exactly the same size as what was in there. So uh, I'm very curious to see if this works, if they can really make this pliable enough to get those big brass parts through these small holes. I've had it in some nearly boiling water for about a minute. It certainly is more pliable. Let's see if I can manage to get it over these. Kind of working, but it certainly requires some force. I'm going to heat this up a little bit longer, give it another try. A little more heat and a little persuasion with a small screwdriver, and I got it on. It's made nice and solid. Works great, just like the original. Definitely the way to go. I noticed this high voltage cage cover is pretty dirty. So what I'm doing is using some Rust-Oleum rust stripper and a small brush and just brushing it on. Now you could also clean this with uh, like a multi-purpose cleaner and kind of scrub this off. But I find this stuff just cuts right through this old dirt and crud and uh, I can just rinse this off. And we're good to go. Nice clean metal. Oh, 
Okay, next up, I want to replace the foam gasket that was mounted on this thin piece of cardboard. I've got a couple types of foam here. This is rectangular with sticky back. And this stuff is round. The original was kind of square. I just went out to Menards and they didn't have any square. It was either round or this flat rectangular stuff. If I was to go with this, it's wide enough, it's going to actually go over these uh, mounting holes, so I would either have to cut this leg down the middle to make it square, or just go with the round stuff, so I think I'll go with the round, that's what I used in a couple other sets and it worked out just fine. To hold it in place, I'm going to use some Weldwood contact cement. Dab a little bit all around the perimeter on the cardboard and likewise on the foam. And then I'll carefully work my way around. That went down fairly easy. Here's where the joint is. I cut the foam at an angle, use a little bit of contact cement and glue the ends together. It's fairly seamless. And it's supposed to go like so on the face plate. I think that'll work out just fine. The idea is that this presses up against the glass CRT so it doesn't bang against this plastic. Alright, I've got this chassis secure. Now as for the back, I do have the original back. And unfortunately when I got it, the corner was broken off. However, when I took the chassis out and poked around inside the cabinet, I found the broken out piece. So I'm going to attempt to glue that back on. I think it'll work out fairly well. I'll use some wood glue and dilute it and soak it in and clamp it and mush it back together as best I can. I also want to replicate this back for my 20X12 set that does not have a back. It'll be fairly easy. Get some type of masonite material trace this pattern out, cut it out, drill a whole mess of holes and find some kind of, uh, oh I think an old aluminum ashtray would probably work out well for the cup there that covers the CRT back. For now though I'll leave this off. I'm going to bring this into uh, the other room so I'm going to go up to my cable system and put the knobs on. Let's take one final look at this set playing. I reinstalled the knobs, plugged this set in, and hooked it up to my analog cable setup. That set you see in the background is the Big Brother console version, a 24A12. I have a whole video restoration series on that you might like. So let's power this set up and see if there's anything worth watching on TV. I'll turn the overhead lights off too as these sets are best viewed in the dark. Looks like we have Perry Mason. There are modifications you can make to the set to reduce or eliminate those retrace lines, but I haven't messed with it yet. I kind of want to leave the set all original and see how it would perform. So in order to keep those retrace lines from being hairy, I have to keep the brightness down pretty low. Just adjusting the fine tuning now.
Now there is an answer. All right, so let's play the actual quite well. was concerned with more than the death of General Brand. He was concerned with involving Mitchell Heller as the apparent murderer. Mr. Sewell will portray the murderer who parked out of sight and entered the lodge and confronted General Brand. So that's the end of yet another project. The I hope you guys enjoyed this series on restoring an Admiral 20X11. Now he wanted Heller to have an hallucination, a delusion, to see something that didn't exist. Step two, the murderer sets the stage. As we shall see, it would be necessary to have an exact record of how the stage was set. That camera takes and develops its own photographs in a matter of seconds.